But today I was, I was asked to come talk a little bit about kind of the basics of first aid. And so I uh, really want to uh, impress upon you the importance of uh, th something as simple as, as bleeding control. And it, and it might seem uh, simple, but there are a little bit of uh, complexities to it. And so, uh, you know, who here has, uh, you know, ever cut themselves? Even just a paper clip or even just a paper cut, right? You know, don't those sting? Uh, has anybody inadvertently, seriously cut themselves? I had a really, you know, difficult time getting, uh, getting something to, to bleed or stop bleeding, excuse me, not, it, sometimes it's easy to get things to bleed, Some, it, the difficult portion comes when we're trying to stop the bleeding. Yeah, with the kids, right? You know, whether it be, you know, uh, bloody noses, right? Or they've cut something or they've uh, wiped out on their bike and they're, you know, uh, bleeding. Or uh, if you had something as, as uh, grotesque as what we call an open fracture where, you know, you can see bone on the outside when it should be on the inside, right? You know, all those types of things. Uh, it's important to know what to do in those uh, situations. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we do live in a day and age, which is a scary day and age, but, uh, you know, having to uh, know how to potentially control um, bleeding from, a let's say, a gunshot wound, right? Uh, you know, we as a nation have done a very good job of uh, teaching people CPR, Right, you know, teaching how to do compressions and do the breaths and all of those things. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, if somebody has uh, a, is, is bleeding ex extensively, it, it doesn't matter if we know how to do CPR if if we don't control the blood first. And so, actually, there's been kind of a shift in focus uh, where we talked about ABCs, which means establish an airway work on their breathing and doing uh, circulation and chest compressions, uh, we are now moving the circulation portion to the front and that starts with bleeding control. And so we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? Uh, so we'll start with simple and move to a little bit more complex, okay? So I'm washing the dishes and I cut my finger on a knife in the, in the soapy water. My mother-in-law is notorious for throwing the sharp knives in the soapy water and you can't see it and you inadvertently cut yourself. That has happened on a, uh, a couple of times, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, anyhow, so I've cut my finger, right? You know, it, and, it, and it's bleeding and I, uh, so maybe what, I'll turn it over to you guys. What would you do? I've cut my finger with a knife, it's bleeding. Put pressure on it, perfect, right? You know, and, and what can we use to put pressure on it? Okay. Paper towels, washcloths, all those types of things. Yep, you know, you don't have to have fancy bleeding kits. You know, you can do something, something as simple as I have a paper towel, I have a dish towel, I have my washcloth, right? You know, those types of things. So I've put pressure on it, right? Great first start, putting pressure on it. What's something else I can do for this finger that's, that's bleeding? Raise it over your head. And anybody know why that um, helps? Yes, but how? What, why do you think? Yeah, right. You know it, uh, that blood that you, with your heart pumping blood, right? It, it has a little more difficult time pumping it up than it does just you know down. Okay, so I put pressure on my finger, and I got it above my head, and it's starting to slow down, and I'm able to look at it, and it's bleeding just a little bit. How do you think we deal with this uh, this finger? Nope, don't need it. Starting to slow on its own. Pressure seems to be helping. What do you think? Maybe just put a Band-Aid on it? Perfect. All right, you just, you just fixed your, your first injury, okay? Now, if I can't get it controlled, right? You know, it's still bleeding, you know, pressure, uh, that Band-Aid, it's kind of soaking through there. What, what does that probably need? Stitches, yep, stitches or glue, depending on, on where, where staples maybe, all those types of things, okay? So now, I, I didn't just cut my finger, cut my finger off, okay? I really wasn't paying attention, okay? How, how are we gonna deal with this one? What, what will we start with? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely, yep. So we, I go over, I grab my paper towel or I grab my uh, dishcloth or I grab my washcloth and I'm putting pressure on it and that pressure is not necessarily doing the trick it is bleeding through there at a pretty rapid rate not just not just slowing down what do we think yeah do you know does anybody know what that's called that tight thing tourniquet, tourniquet. absolutely 
Okay, so we can, uh, there's all sorts of different types of tourniquets. Uh, the one we use uh, usually is uh, what we call a cat tourniquet uh, because these uh, have the ability to uh, apply to yourself. Uh, I, I personally carry one with me in my, in my vehicle. Uh, I carry one with me in my in my backpack that I take to to church and things like that. Because, uh, like I said, in, in the day and age that we're in, you you just never know if you're uh, if you're going to need it. Uh, and so, yeah, you could uh, potentially apply a tourniquet. Uh, has any ever, anybody ever put a tourniquet on? Got a couple. Okay. All right. Well, if you got experience, you want to come on up here. You didn't know there was going to be a, par a participation above just raising your hand, did you? Okay. Well, do you want to be the applier or the apply e? I could be the apply e. Oh, even better! I'm glad. I'd much rather be your arm than mine. Okay, so, all right. So he, remember, we have cut our finger in this scenario, right? So where do you think we should uh, put this tourniquet? Here, we'll do here, right? So should I do it here, 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 up here? What do we think? At somebody's uh, here at the elbow. Where else? Anybody else? Where do you think? Closer to the wound. And why do you think that is? Yeah, absolutely. There's not a need to stop the blood flow from here to here, right? Especially when it's here. Uh, so what we do is when we apply a tourniquet, we, we try to avoid uh, applying it to a joint. So uh, somebody said elbow, wrist, we would want to avoid that. So in this situation, can't really apply a tourniquet to the hand itself. So we're, we're going to apply it right above the right above the wrist. Okay. So you ready, dude? Yeah. What's your name? So I can quit calling you, dude. Uh, my name's Cohen. Cohen. Yeah. All right. Well, you're the first Cohen that I know. So there you go, Cohen. All right. So if Cohen wanted to apply this himself, he could. Uh, so you pull it tight, right? Take as much slack out of it as you can, and then you Velcro it. Okay. Does anybody know what this plastic bar is called? Extra super duper bonus credit if you can tell me what this thing is called. Tim. No. It does do that though, but that's not what it's called. It's called a windlass? I don't know why. That's just what it's called. So, all right, well, nobody, I, I get to keep my extra super duper credit. So, <laughs> so you're going to turn this once, twice, three times. And then you're going to lock it in there. Okay. Can anybody see what that says? No. Upside down, right side up. What's that say? Time. It says time. So what do you think you put on this uh, white thing? The time, you put it on. the time you put it on, right? Yeah. Does anybody know why? They need to know how long it hasn't had circulation. That's right. Yeah. So uh, we, uh, the, the, all the studies uh, out there show, you know, you, you want to have a tourniquet on uh, somewhere less than six hours. Otherwise, you, you start to run into permanent nerve damage. Does that hurt? Yeah. You, you can say if it does. I just can't move my hand, that's all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, you put the time on that. It cuts blood circulation off, and um, you've done your job for the most part. So let me ask you this. If that tourniquet doesn't work and that's still bleeding, what's something else you can do? This is like, what's that? Cauterize it. You could cauterize it, yep. I don't carry that in, uh, in the field, and I'm, and I'm sure nobody has, unless you're going to like go the old school Western way of like getting your cigarette lighter out of your car. Do they even make vehicles with cigarette lighters anymore? I don't even know. And like, you know, searing it, that's, that's a, I, I do not promote that. I do not condone that. So please don't say, well, I learned at, you know. Okay, so, do you know, so it's kind of a trick question. You can apply another tourniquet, actually. So you have your first tourniquet on, um, you apply your next one, and you uh, try to do it almost overlapping because you don't want any space in there. It, uh, and so, thank you, that's all I needed. Okay. All right, so tourniquets. These, are, these have saved counsel, countless lives, uh, especially when it comes to like, you know, military, police, things like that. Uh, uh, where can't you use one of these? The neck. The neck is a very important place in which you cannot use a tourniquet. Absolutely. You can't use it around the torso. So it's basically uh, meant for extremities. Okay? A lot of vasculature. Uh, so when you twist these, you t twist them. What's, what's one way that you know that you have this tight enough? Bleeding stops, right? That's one way. What's another way? 
Anybody know? No pulse. Lose pulse. Because these are meant to cut off the circulation to a vein or an artery. Do we know what veins and arteries do? Let's, all right, we're going to do a little anatomy lesson. Okay, arteries. Do they have blood with oxygen or without oxygen? What's that? Nope. With. They start with A, they carry air, that's the way I remembered, uh, and they're red, right? So the red, you think of a red blood cell, right? Has oxygen in it. Does that carry blood to tissue or away from tissue? To tissue, right? Carries it away from the heart. Again, A, artery. So takes blood to it, delivers the oxygen. That's our pulse sites that we can feel, right? Carotid, you know, all the different pulse sites. That's, those are arteries, okay? Blood needs to come back to your heart. Travels through what? Veins. Yep, that's why those are that blue because they don't have oxygen in it, right? Okay, so we got it. And then it goes from there. Where does it go next? From a vein, it goes into what? Close. Goes to your lungs, gets reoxygenated, goes to your heart, and then gets pumped back out through the arteries, right? That's your circulatory system, okay? So when we apply a tourniquet, we want to cut off the circulation to the artery, okay? So that's why we feel for the pulse sites and things like that. We actually can get ourselves into a little bit of a trouble if all we've done is cut off the, um, the circulation to a, the, the vein and not the artery. Then you, it backs up, it, it, it makes the matter worse, okay? So a couple of additional things uh, that it's important. So I got this nice limb, we'll just call it a limb, and on it we have different types of injuries, right? So we got a puncture injury, uh, we have a slit injury, but it's actually pretty deep, uh, and then we have a, a, another kind of puncture type injury, okay? This would probably be close to what you would consider when you have like a, a bullet injury, right? Small entrance, larger exit, okay? Okay, that's not quite a, f on this torso though, as you stick your finger in it, it doesn't go all the way through. Anyhow, it's like that. So, I've put pressure over this. Okay, maybe I don't have a tourniquet, right? So I put pressure over it and it's like, eh, I'm still kind of getting some blood, okay? And when I say put pressure, I mean like actually put pressure, right? Not just lay it over it, but actually put pressure on it, okay? So that pressure isn't necessarily working. This is a leg or an arm. It could be my leg. I'd prefer it to be somebody else's, right? So I'm pressuring it. I'm getting some blood uh, uh, that's soaking through the, the towel or shirt or whatever I'm using, okay? What's, what's another step we can take? We can start stuffing it, yep. Or the fancy, not so fancy word, it's called packing it, right? So you can pack the wound. So do I just like open it up and just, you know, stuff the whole thing in here like that? What's stopping me? What's that? What's, what's stopping me from doing it? Uh, the knowledge that there's a better way uh, and that when you leave here, uh, you'll know that there's a better way. That's what's stopping me. All right. So instead, I want to take a corner of it and start packing it in, okay? The reason for that is it, create, it, it creates greater surface area to soak that up. And you just, I mean, you just keep packing, keep packing. I probably shouldn't have chose the world's biggest wound here on the leg because uh, otherwise I'm going to be standing in front of you. But you get the idea. So I fill this all the way up to the brim to where it's out of the top. I can take any number of other things and keep pressure on it as well. So if we don't necessarily have a uh, tourniquet readily available, uh, we can pack it. Uh, the nice thing about these, um, these stop the bleed kits is they're vacuum sealed. They, they last basically you know, until you break the seal on them. Uh, they'll have a tourniquet in them. They have scissors. They'll have a Sharpie so that you can write the, the time on it. Uh, they're re relatively cheap, uh, about 25 uh, bucks a kit. Um, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of having them in, in classrooms, I, uh, churches community areas, uh, put them right next to your, your AEDs. Uh, and so if you take nothing else uh, from this on how to do this, also having one of those, I, I personally uh, highly, highly recommend uh, because, you know, CPR is only going only gonna to carry you uh, so far. The nice thing about this ty these types of gauzes in these kits, um, also they, they're called, um, they're, they're, 
they're impregnated, meaning they have like a chemical in there that also helps uh, increase the, the clotting cascade. So uh, where, you know, you could stuff a washcloth in, this is better because not only do you have the surface area and the absorption from it, but it also has a, a clotting mechanism in it. So those are all things you can do as bystanders until, you know, greater help arrives or until you can get them to uh, what we call definitive treatment, like an emergency department uh, type place. Questions, thoughts, concerns? Related to this, questions about EMS, questions about nursing, any, you know, working on an ambulance service, any of those types of things? So you don't have one of those fancy kits and you have a dirty shirt on the back. It, better than nothing. So here's my, here's, here's, uh, here's my two cents on, I have a piece of fabric, right? Whatever it is, could be, you know, a rag that's been laying in the trunk of my car for six months, right? We, can, we stop the bleed, that's the most important thing that we can do. We can treat infection on the backside, right? Whether that be through oral or IV antibiotics, it, you know, it, without being too terribly crass, right? You know, we don't care that the person got infected if they're dead, right? And so if we can potentially save a life, just like the, you know, you, have, you might have some nerve injury uh, with, the, with the application of a, uh, a tourniquet, again, Dead people don't have nerve injury. So, uh, you know, it, the, the steps we can take in order to, to stop a bleeding patient, uh, I say uh, use whatever's available. Any other questions? Yes? So you said you started out as a nurse. Is that a typical way to get into EMS? It is not. It is as mess as, as possible. Uh, so typically the, the starting of an EM, in EMS is either through an EMR or an EMT. So an EMR is a first responder. Uh, you know, there's a lot of them on volunteer agencies, uh, volunteer fire departments, and uh, you can be less than 18 and, and be a first responder. Uh, to be an EMT, uh, the way I best know to explain an EMT versus a paramedic is uh, a nurse, like a clinical assistant nurse's aide to a nurse based on what they can do. So an EMT, that's the lower level. Uh, you can actually start taking EMT classes your, uh, your senior year uh, at local community colleges, Blackhawk for example. And uh, once you turn 18, you can take your national EMS, uh, EMT exam uh, and get certified and then you can start working as an EMT. And uh, then the next step from an EMT is uh, to become a paramedic. And that's about another year of school. You do a first semester, second semester, a little bit of ride time. And so there's people that technically can graduate high school and be a paramedic by the following uh, spring. And, uh, and so that's the typical route. And then, um, you know, we do have some staff that have gone on and, and become nursing, uh, nurses, excuse me. And that's usually another two plus years uh, to become a nurse. And then you make uh, a little bit more money as a nurse than you would as, say, a paramedic. Paramedic makes a little more money than an EMT does. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, how long is it, like, like, what's the average time for a person to bleed out? I know it, like, depends on the it, it depends on what the, inter uh, the injury is. It depends on if it's a vein versus artery. It depends on if it's a main artery versus um, a lesser artery. Uh, but, you know, if you had a really bad injury to say, um, uh, like the arteries that are in your, in your uh, uh, groin, I mean, you can bleed out in a couple minutes. Yes, sir? We do. Uh, and, and so to, if you have an interest in uh, ride-alongs, uh, you just go to genesishealth.com. And uh, it's under the job shadow, and uh, they get you signed up. And there's some paperwork that you have to fill out to make sure that you have, um, you know, all the stuff you need from, uh, um, you know, they have you sign some paperwork basically saying, like, hey, you know, keep health information private, that kind of stuff. And then uh, they work with, with me, actually, and uh, we can get that set up. I highly encourage you if you have any interest in EMS whatsoever. Sir? How long? So I have been a nurse since 2008. I was a clinical assistant in the emergency department before that. Uh, and I, when I was work, so since, and then from 2013 through 2016, uh, I, I was the nurse manager of the emergency department in ICU on top of doing some flight nurse stuff with MedForce. Uh, and then I've been over the ambulance service for four years now. In fact, I just had my four year anniversary over here at ambulance. Any other questions? 
Yes, sir. Was there ever someone who you thought was going to die? Like it was almost a guarantee that they'd kill me? Yes. And I've also had it on the flip side where I was surprised. Um, yep. Uh, you know, the, the way I look at it is uh, we can do everything right and somebody can uh, still uh, die. And then there's times where uh, it seems like you, nothing went in our favor and, and they live. Uh, sometimes there's just no rhyme or reason. Uh, you know, when we arrive on scene in an ambulance, we don't necessarily always know the extent of somebody's injuries, right? We don't have x-ray, we don't have CT, right? We can't look on the inside. Uh, what we can see is uh, what happened leading up to it uh, for the most part, and then any visible injuries, and, and we kind of work backwards from there. Any other questions? I'm already 10 minutes into somebody else's time, so I don't want to... You're the last one. Oh, I'm the last one. Okay, in this room. All right, any other questions? And I'll just keep answering questions. I love questions. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is which is worse, internal bleeding or external bleeding? Uh, I'd say internal bleeding uh, for for two reasons. One, you you can't see what you're dealing with, right? Um, and external bleeding, uh, it, it's easier for the layperson um, to to fix, right? You know, we just talked about all the different ways we can kind of fix uh, external bleeding. Uh, but when you get these internal issues, uh, you know, I can't put a tourniquet on, uh, you know, a through and through that, you know, went through the, I can try to pack it, but even then I might not be able to get to the, the source. Any, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's people that don't want our help. It's always kind of interesting, especially if they're the ones that called. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we've uh, shown up on, on scene, or I've had patients in the emergency department that uh, they, don't, they don't want us to, to do anything for them. And uh, those can become frustrating scenarios, to say the least. So we just, you know, you try to be calm and, and try to rationalize to the best of your ability, but, you know, even when you're calm and rational, there's people that aren't calm and are irrational. And so, uh, you know, unfortunately in those situations, you, you gotta go through uh, some steps in order to, to more or less force the issue and, and provide care. Yes, sir. Have you ever had a life Yeah, yeah, numerous times, uh, numerous times. Those are, uh, that's a, that's a team effort uh, when when those scenarios happen. Uh, you know, when it, it might start as a physical restraint, might start uh, then go to uh, needing to give medications, whether that's through an IV, um, whether that's through. Do people wear Levi jeans anymore? Uh, we would in the emergency department or even in the EMS, we'll call it the Levi special because you gotta go right through their pant legs. Uh, so yeah. It, again, like the previ uh, uh, the previous speaker, we're never short on stories. That's for sure. Yes, sir. You said you work in a trauma room. Mm -hmm. How was that? Uh, it was interesting. Uh, I, I very much that was probably the, my favorite part of the job. Is as weird as that is to say, uh, because you see a lot of uh, a lot of tragedy. Uh, you see a lot of people and uh, uh, that that don't make it, that are of all ages, and and you have some just absolute heartbreaking scenarios. Uh, but the thing I enjoyed about it is, uh, well, there's multiple things I enjoyed about it. One, uh, a, a high-functioning trauma team. I don't know if there's a better team out there. Uh, and when you have a high-functioning trauma team, that room is almost silent uh, because people, they just know their role and they, and they flow through what they need to do. Uh, and it's very systematic. And uh, there's a little, it's a little bit of an art form when, when you come to it. And so uh, I very much enjoyed it, uh, even though there was uh, quite a bit of tragedy that, that came along with it. There's a lot of times where, like I said, in spite of our best efforts, it's just there's nothing we could have done to, to save somebody. In those situations, there's times where we might not be able to save their life, but we might be able to uh, do enough to where we can uh, make it so that person can be an organ donor or things like that. So live with a baby? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've not on the ambulance side, but uh, we have uh, in the front seat of a pickup truck right there in the parking lot uh, in the emergency department. Uh, had one uh, baby that we delivered in the uh, without again without being crass in the uh, in the toilet of the emergency department uh, in the waiting room. Mm -hmm. She quote unquote didn't know she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's a you know if you like uh, some uh, something new every day, uh, healthcare in general is probably for you. Uh, but if you really like something that not only is it different every day, it's different minute by minute. Uh, you know, EMS is is a great uh, great gig for that. So why do you keep like switching your whatever? Yeah. So uh, so a lot of it was through promotion. So I started as a a, a staff nurse. Uh, well, actually, a clinical assistant. Then I became a nurse because that's what I was going to school for. Uh, and then I uh, was asked if I would uh, consider doing uh, like an interim manager position, uh, and I accepted. And I must have done okay because they the interim turned into a full time gig. Uh, and then the thing I like about leadership the most is that. Uh, where I, I don't necessarily get as much patient interaction, which is why I went into nursing, right? Uh, I get to take care of the people that take care of the people, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of pride that I have in uh, being able to uh, you know, work through challenging scenarios with our staff uh, so that they can go out and provide uh, care to the patients. And so uh, that's kind of why I went from point A to point B, and a little bit uh, also was boredom. Right, you know, I'd been in the role of manager for about five years. We did a major construction project uh, that was challenging in its own in its own right. And once that was done, it was kind of well, what's the what's the next thing to challenge? And so came over to the ambulance, which is not something I had a ton of experience in, um, and tried my hand at that. And they haven't fired me yet, so I must be doing at least somewhat okay. Or there's nobody else that wants the job. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, can I ask you a little bit more of like a personal question? You can ask. I can't promise that I'll answer, but you can ask. Uh, how do you deal with those tragedies? Yeah, actually, that's. Uh, I really appreciate you asking that question. Uh, I deal with that in a number of ways. Okay. Uh, so, I, first and foremost, I have a, a very supportive wife and, and parents, and uh, that is a benefit. And I know that not everybody has that benefit. Okay. So I. Uh, that's uh, one of the main things. Uh, uh, I have a, a really strong faith, which again, uh, it helps. And I know that's not everybody's thing, but uh, it helps me uh, in, uh, to know that uh, I don't always get to know what the plan is, right? You know, I get the question, how do you deal with the death of a little kid, right? For example, there's no answer for that. I don't know. I don't know why they died. I, I don't know, right? And, uh, you know, the faith background gives me the ability to say, hey, you know what? Uh, I don't get to know the plan. I just need to be available for the plan, whatever that is, right? And so that helps as well. Uh, having a strong uh, support system of people you work with helps immensely, right? Uh, so my wife's not a uh, not in healthcare whatsoever. She was a teacher by background, stay-at-home mom currently, and uh, there's stuff that you see in healthcare that if you've not seen it, you've not been in it, you've not smelled it, you've not whatever, right? difficult for them to understand uh, because they have no experience related to it. And so uh, being open with some coworkers, trusted coworkers, right? Not everybody, right? Not everybody can be trusted, but uh, some people that you're very close with and, and respect uh, has been uh, very helpful and I've been very fortunate over the years. Uh, and then if none of that is working, uh, admitting that you need help and you need somebody to talk to. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to work for an organization that has a very strong, what they call EAP, or Employee Assistance Program, uh, that provides uh, therapists, you know, counselors, uh, clergy, uh, as needed in order to, to work through people, or to work through issues with people. And, uh, and so it, there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, that's what's worked well for me uh, over the years. Uh, you know, part of it also is, uh, I knew that if I stayed in the emergency department or uh, uh, on the ambulance side, I don't necessarily get to know everybody's backstory, and that's a little bit of a defense mechanism that I that I have in uh, in store. Uh, when I was going through nursing school, uh, my instructor was wise enough to know that that is something that I had put in place, and so she had me do my uh, my internship uh, on the oncology floor. You know, some of those patients are up there for weeks, right? You get to know them really well, and not just the patient, but the family. And, uh, and I recognized early on, like, I, I, I care too much about people to know too much of their backstory. And so that's another reason why I, I stuck around in EMS. And so knowing a little bit about yourself helps as well. 
uh, but never being afraid to ask for help and never uh, being too proud to say, hey, this is something I'm struggling with, and if I don't take care of myself, then I can't go on and take care of others. And again, yes, why I've uh, moved into uh, from position to position, and that's been a big part of it, is the ability to sit with staff members that are struggling and, um, and are in need and say, hey, let's, let's work through some of this stuff so that you can be the best person that you are in order to go out and take care of uh, people that are in some of the worst uh, days of their lives. Any other questions? I know that's a fairly heavy one to, to end on, but I think that is very important. If anybody has any experience, uh, any interest in moving into the emergency services world, whether that's police, fire, ambulance service, nurses, doctors, PAs, whatever, is, is to know that uh, going in, that, that there is help available. You do not need to struggle in silence. All right. Like I said, that's a heavy.